Ben Stone. Uh, oh, and Je Jeffrey Tucker. And I am Mike, and this is some other guy. I think he's Mexican or something. <laughs> What's your name? I'm Danny. Oh. Okay, I'm sorry. Right. Just Danny, no last name. <laughs> no, he doesn't use his last name anymore. Yeah. <laughs> it's not real popular. Yeah. So before the show, um, I, I approached Ben, as I do many of our guests, and asked him if he had something that was on his mind lately that interested Were you in the public restroom when you said this? <laughs> I'm sorry. I, 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 yeah. I promised I wouldn't trigger Joe anymore. I'm sorry. Right. I take that back. Delete that from the record. <laughs> Edit right, we that will, out. We, we will delete that from the record and continue on with the show, Mike. Um, so I approached Ben and asked him if he had something that has um, been on his mind lately that he'd like to discuss. And he uh, mentioned that there is a, a, a division that has, um, seems to be permeating through the anarchy community as different people are kind of fracturing into different philosophical ideas and it's manifesting in, in multiple little arguments that we all see in social media and also um, in, 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 uh, on podcasts and other, other places, debates um, that are being hosted just to discuss these issues. And uh, this is a concern for Ben, and he wanted to bring it up. So I'm going to hand the mic over to Ben, and he can tell us what his thoughts are. Um, I suppose one of the things that disturbs me the most about all the, change that is, the changes that have taken place in the last year, year and a half or so, is, is not that we see uh, people say, calling themselves by, this, by these names that we have come ac accustomed to, to thinking of as like ourselves, uh, and then those same people saying and doing really bizarre things and, and, and us looking at that saying, that's not what I am. How, how did this become that? And and a lot and one of the voices I hear so many times repeated over and over is, well, we just need some unity. We need to get back together, put this thing back together, get it back on the tracks. Yeah. And my my knee jerk my knee jerk reaction to that is, no, I don't want it. that that train wherever it's going is not where I'm going, and I don't want to be on it. But uh, I don't know. Maybe Jeffrey's got a different view on that. Well, in particular, I'd love you to, uh, to j just fill that out a little bit. I mean, uh, you're talking about the uh, the growing defenses of you know immigration restriction, you know the you know that that sort of thing. The uh, the idea that that uh, Trump is a god emperor, you know that sort of, which I, I I don't I don't think of that as being. Well, he sometimes he is, you know, when he <laughs> when he pulled out of that that Paris Accord, you know, that he was god emperor for about 15 seconds. <laughs> I, I hate that Paris Accord. I mean, what were they thinking? You know, um, y y you know, you know the this thinker F. A. Hayek, right? I mean, yeah. so y you know, he says like y you don't have yes, of course. No, nobody has <laughs> has has the knowledge sufficient to run to run to run any kind of plan, you know, because I was taught in my I was taught in my economics class that the government is very good at central planning. <laughs> that's right. That's right. That's, no, I, I was taught. I was taught the same thing. I remember. I, I remember the day I dangerously bumped into some uh, some Austrian writings, and I realized everything that they had told me in school was wrong. You know. So, but it, but anyway. So the, uh, anyway, the, the whole thing is hilarious. I mean, the idea that some bureaucrats would meet in Paris to plan, you know, uses of uh, global uh, ener energy as a way of uh, controlling the climate uh, 100 years from now. You know, is is you're right. He, you laugh, but I mean that's what I want to do too. It's it's just so to me that Trump pulled out of that was just a no-brainer. You know, I'm glad he did. You know, I'm, I, it doesn't matter either way. Probably, but I was it seemed like it, it showed a good instinct there. But I'm um, my God, the reaction to that was you hate polar bears. Yeah, right. <laughs> It was right every day in the New York Times. It was just, you know, and that's my paper. That's my paper that I read. Maybe that's my problem, right? I read the New York Times every day, and it's making me crazy or something, uh, you know. And I, I desperately want them to be right on it. You know, I want them, because I, I sort of weirdly love the New York Times. And so it frustrates me when they're wrong, and I want to, oh, my God, you know, you really need to shape up. It's like my friends tell me all the time, like, what is wrong with you? This has been fake news for 100 years. Yeah, I'm you know. curious, what is your motivation to read the New York Times? Well, in, in a weird way, it's the ruling class paper, right? So, uh, so in a sense, uh, like, all truth is in there. But you have to read really deep. I've learned, well, 
I, I have my New York Times decoder ring on all the time, you know? So, and I, kn I know how the paper works. I understand its language. I know the writers. I know the, its rhetoric. And I know how to extract what's, what true information is from it. My mistake, variously, is wanting them to be, uh, uh, you know, periodically correct on anything. You know? so <laughs> that's, a, that's usually an error. Anyway, Ben, tell me, tell me what's driving you crazy. I mean, and why you decided to leave with that opaque, you know, comment. <laughs> Um, you know, I'm not an accusatory type of a person, but, uh, yes, yeah. you are. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, uh, you know, it, it, you hear these voices for years that have told us that, uh, you know, there's a gun in the room and it's the state and the, everything the state does is behind this gun in the room. And then there are tears of joy coming from these people when a guy gets elected president and you think, what, what? did I miss five years ago and seven years ago that it, it, it is different than now? I mean, how, what changed? N nothing really changed. So that, that causes me to, to question the motive from the beginning, and I don't know any other way to, to think about it. But then to want to unite us back with these people, it just seems like, no, I, I don't want anything to do with any of those. Um, anybody to me, and I'll try to be polite to people as much as possible. I'm not as polite as Jeffrey, but I like to be polite as much as possible. Jeff, relatively speaking, you are a lot more polite than I am. So. <laughs> relatively speaking. I don't speaking, think there's a single um, person on earth that would dispute that. Everybody <laughs> is more polite than you are, Danny. I, I, sometimes, I, sometimes, I sometimes lose it. You know, like somebody would just trigger me in just the right way on Twitter. <laughs> I, I, I have so, no. Sometimes it happens. I just blow, I just lose it and I blow up. And uh, but I mean, it happens. To, well, you, you saw the video that went viral inadvertently with me you know, yelling like at Nazis, ye yelling at uh, Spencer. You know, um, and it but shocked everybody because everybody thinks it was, I was so nice and whatever. And but then you know, but then when the Nazi, or the quasi Nazi, shows up to the Liberty Conference and, and starts to hold court, you know, I just I just lost it. You know, I d I really did, and I just. I use the okay, and of course somebody had a video camera on. It went viral, you know. Um, and 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 this this guy Richard Spencer has meanwhile made something like three hour long videos, you know, atta attacking me. <laughs> that, that's their method. You know, and I can, you know, and I, I can't, I can't even bear to li you know listen to even you know five seconds of any of them, you know. So may I ask, uh, what do you define as? Uh, Quasi or neo-Nazi, because I'll, I'll I'll be candid here, there are some things on the alt right that I tend to agree with, but um, I don't find myself in the full camp of it. Right. And the interesting thing about that is that, given my racial disposition, sure. um, I I don't I don't well, see it as a racial some issue. Some of my some of my best friends are 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 I mean my my best friend in Atlanta is uh, T T J Brown. Who's you know raised you know uh, and and he's uh, the 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 <laughs> how do I put it? Um, T J Brown is very dedicated to his own African Americanness. He's also a quasi Nazi, <laughs> and, and and he admits it. <laughs> you know, so some I'm just telling you, some of my best friends are black Nazis. I mean, that's just just I'm just. I think they had a Chappelle show where the uh, the. The black guy was in the Klan, and he was blind and didn't know he was black. <laughs> I know, right? No, but look, I'm, I'm, let me just tell you something. And this is actually a serious point. Nobody's going to pay any attention to it, so just file it away for later. Um, the last time a thoroughly rigorous right-wing Hegelian neo-fascist neo a collectivist ideology was extant in the world was during the interwar period. It has been lost to us in almost entirely since World War II. It popped up in the world just like a couple of years ago. We are unfamiliar with it. So I understand. People want to dabble in it. They think it's sort of interesting. Oh, but these are fascinating ideas. They don't like the left. They don't like the socialists. They don't like the communists. What we don't seem to understand is that Hegelianism in 1820 broke in two branches, left wing, which ended up in Marxism, right wing Hegelianism, which ended up in Nazism. The, the second part is almost invisible to us. We don't understand the tradition of Friedrich List, of, of Fichte, of, 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 of Carlyle, you know, of um, uh, Carl Schmitt. You know, we don't understand them because they're almost invisible to us. They're not taught to us in school. 
uh, we've never encountered them before. So we need to, uh, as an intellectual project, reconstruct the history of right Hegelianism to understand that this is a real thing. I mean, it's the real deal. And when you start dabbling in this shit, it's actually extremely dangerous for your mind, for your soul, for your, for your, for your heart, but mostly for the world. There's no improvement to having a right-wing uh, a, a right-wing authoritarian regime over a left-wing authoritarian. There's no improvement. Is that like the epitome of the Hegelian dialectic? And Ben, could you um, <laughs> tell us what the Hegelian dialectic <laughs> is, please? Let's all, let's all talk about Hegel. <laughs> well, you know, what, I, what I'd actually like to touch on what, what Jeffrey just said, um, and, and going back to what I was complaining about earlier, if you go back to like uh, 2011, 2012, or even earlier, 2008, 2009, there were so many of us that were talking about this false choice, this, this uh, is it the left boot or the right boot that's on your face? Well, does it really matter? Mm. And, and everybody, un it seemed like everybody understood that in 2008 and 2009. It, it was. Yeah. Jeffrey just said it was a superficial understanding, and it absolutely was, and that was the problem. It seems, I, I see a flaw in this thing of ours. I, I have trouble naming it a liberty movement, um, so I just kind of refer to it as this thing of ours. Um, and I see a flaw in it, and we want so bad to evangelize with all these, everybody that comes along, and they get a, a very rudimentary understanding of it, and, the, and they grasp hold of little pieces of it, and then we tell them, that's it, you're an anarchist, you're, you're one of us. And, but they're not really, because they don't have the, it's not that they're bad, it's just that they don't have the foundational stuff there. They've listened to a couple of podcasts, they've watched a couple of YouTube things, and they're converted, but they don't have the underpinnings. They're like the proverbial house that's built on sand. And as soon as the storm comes, as soon as the big, dumb, orange-skinned storm comes, that clown then they just all get washed away with the... With well, the it's because they don't, have, they don't have the knowledge. And, you know, look, I didn't have the knowledge. Look, I was there, I, you know, hardly anybody's ever called me on this, but I should just tell you. I mean, I was there in 1989 when all this shit began, right? I mean, I mean when I was with Murray at the time, we began to dabble in sort of right-wing ideology, you know, right, what is right, there? Right. And, and I, 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 I sort of languished in this, in this realm for like four years before I began to realize there was something weird. And then another like 20 years goes by, I'm father time here. Uh, another 20 years goes by, and I finally, I finally just, I, I, t I told us I'm gonna. Ha I, I have to figure out what this is. What is this weird ideology that I've been sort of swimming in, not really believing, but it's been around me. Yes. And so I threw myself into like a deep reading program, of reading Spengler and Schmidt and you know Hegel and Carlyle and List and all these guys, and I began to sort of understand there's 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 an arc, there's a there's a framework, um, and I th continuum. I, Yes, and it and it, it's a it was interrupted after World War II. You know, there was an interruption, and so we had three generations that didn't know about it. Let me just quickly. Um, this will take so quick, okay. just so you understand. The question is whether you see the world as characterized primarily by harmony, the possibility of harmony, or the intransigence of conflict. That's the division. So both the left and the right believe that conflict characterizes human engagement. You know? Okay, the left sees it as between workers and peasants and capital, but the right sees it between, you know, Islam and Christianity, men and women, blacks and whites, you know, you name it, right? Or the left is like, oh, the rich versus the poor. The, the right is, is like, oh, the, the West versus everywhere else, and so on. So the, the, this right, Hege right Hegelianism, like, you need to read, uh, like, Oswald Spengler's 1920 book called The Decline of the West. He said, damn it, the West better get organized as a big collective because everybody else is. We better shape up and, and have a consciousness of ourselves and organize ourselves under, under a leadership principle or we'll never be able to beat back the rest of the world which is similarly doing this. This is Spengler, right? right. Very popular stuff. Okay, all this literature disappeared after World War II, so, so we, we suddenly find ourselves in this vacuum. 
and people start dabbling in, in this Spanglerian thought, and we don't recognize what it is. We just see it as like memes online. It's like Pepe memes. <laughs> <laughs> We're like, oh, that's kind of a cute frog. No, it's fucking Hitler, all right? Well, uh, so I have a question for... I got a question for Ben Stone and uh, Tucker as well. Um, so what I find interesting is what you said is uh, y you presented the argument uh, they're not true anarchists, which to me defaults to no true Scotsman. Well, I, I didn't really say they're not true anarchists. Um, I think they are in their heart uh, when, when that, I hate to use religious terminology, but it's really difficult not to, but when that conversion takes place or when they become convinced, there's that moment when they, when they think, yeah, that's right, you know, taxes are theft, and yeah, we should end the state, we should be free. But they don't have, I think, I think they're serious, and, and some of the things some of them have written, and some of the YouTube videos and other things that they've ben, done. I'm mm -hmm. telling you. <laughs> I'm telling you, th look, you know, you, you can run on to any kind of communist activist, including like Noam Chomsky, they will claim that they too are anarchists. Yeah. It's a question yeah. of the transition. And, and sometimes That's the issue. Noam Chomsky will say something that rings true. No, and you can yeah. learn from him. Yeah. I mean, just like you can learn from the right. No, you can, you, you can learn from Chomsky. I read a ton. I was, like, steeped in Chomsky in 1987. Oh, I, yeah, right? <laughs> See, that's my failing. That's why they call me Jeffrey Cooker. I read, I read Chomsky, right? We were all born communists or anarchists or whatever, depending no, on. Honest. I was a communist when I was 15, and then my dad uh, corrected me very quickly. He said, he, no, no, he said, no. <laughs> he said to me, um, so you think a doctor should make as much as a janitor? <laughs> and I was like, oh, some of them. You're right. <laughs> Actually, we all know janitors should make more. I mean, yeah. So um, I'm going to like totally diverge from this because I know this because talk. That's Mike's trademark. That is my <laughs> trademark. But I also know that we are not going to be able to stop talking. So uh, I'm just really pleased that the, uh, my two dream guests of the round table are here. <laughs> and and uh, no, anyway, I don't want to sleep with you. Maybe Ben. But. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> anyway, what I would like to do is uh, this would be very interesting to everyone here. I'm pretty sure, definitely us three. Is could you like um, before we get lost in this great conversation? Could you tell us your anarchy story, your your origin story, of how did you become an anarchist? Both of you. Um, you know, it's a little difficult because my mom and dad both had real hard anarchist streaks in them, and yet my mom was a Republican and my dad was a Democrat. And, and they always said, you know, I don't vote party, I vote for the candidate, and then they go vote, vote for the party. And they usually would not have uh, political discussions between them because they just there was no reason to, they weren't flexible and they would not see it each other's way. But I learned each of their, I, I learned about them and their political beliefs by watching their actual actions. So for instance, with my mom, any th I was fascinated with history from the time I was like 12 or 13. I would read anything I could about history and uh, learn as much as I could. I learned random things like battle plans of different uh, you know, great heroes over the years. And uh, whenever the topic of World War II would come up, and specifically Pearl Harbor, my mom would make sure to tell me that everything I was reading was a lie. That Pearl Harbor was an absolute setup, the Japanese were dupes, they, they had no choice in doing what they were doing, and the whole thing was planned, and they were just reacting to, the, to what they were perceiving as a threat. And this was so obvious to her Having lived through it in her... She, she was there? Like, like was that September 11th well, she, or something? No, this is like she was like a, like, like a normal American just watching this, and she actually discerned this? Yeah, she was actually... Uh, amazing. A lot of people knew this at the time? Uh, uh, in, in her family, it seemed to be the case. Wow, that's amazing. They that were... Amazing. Um, her dad ran a little general store in eastern Kentucky in the Appalachians, <laughs> and she was, at that time... Uh, uh, like 19 and training to be a school teacher. 
so she had some sense. I mean, was it really the knowledge was extant even in like say 1938 that that Roosevelt wanted war and that he was trying to provoke it? That was her argument. Yeah. And it, and, it, and it embedded in me the distrust of everything that schools were telling me. Now, the contrast to that was my dad, who was a, and you got to sit down and let this sink in for a second, he was a self-taught pilot. He, he was so fascinated with airplanes that he bought an airplane before he knew how to fly. And he played with it until he figured out how to fly. And then he would refuse to go and get his license because his, his thought, and he would explain this to you, his thought process is, how can they possibly regulate the sky? Well, of course they can. Not to mention, not to mention, I'm a, I'm a self-taught surgeon. <laughs> and, I, and I give really good discounts on implants and all that type of shit. And also, it, it's from the same medical van where I perform the surgeries, so. <laughs> I'm a self-taught cum- cunnilingologist. <laughs> I didn't say that out loud, did I? <laughs> well, anyway, um, I was never introduced to libertarianism until I was doing work with um, a Normal, National Organization for Reform of Marijuana Laws. This was in 78, I believe. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Um, We were going uh, door to door with, like, I had a briefcase. I wore a suit. I still had hair like this, you know, almost like a long haired Mormon. Yeah. And I went door to door and I would knock on the door in the afternoons and talk to housewives. Yeah. And and I would hand them pamphlets. No, I I was uh, (laughs) on foot. Um, But in our meetings ahead of time, before we would go out and hit a neighborhood, one of the people in there was a libertarian. The rest were just potheads, you know. But, um, and he and I would talk. And, and, this, and his ideas seemed to really resonate with me. And then these things kind of, and then I got completely hoodwinked by uh, Ronald Reagan. Because he said such beautiful libertarian things. He, he had beautiful speeches. He, he really did. If he actually did what he said in his speeches, that had been pretty phenomenal. Well, they did. He was way better than like Trump from a libertarian, right? Oh, no. Yeah. Oh yeah. The funny thing, the funny thing is that, uh, if I recall correctly, is that uh, Reagan actually was uh, he considered himself a libertarian up until the point he was nominated into the Republican Party. I'm, I may be wrong on this, but I my he was always a cold warrior. That's the thing. I mean, he always you know he wanted to battle the communists about his. Oh, yeah, he everyone. had this ma- he had this Manichaean view that the U.S. was represented good. Right, and, 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 and Russia represented the great evil in the world. So you always have to be suspicious. Well, they they're all communists. Uh, right, but I mean, you have to be <laughs> suspicious of anybody with this kind of Manichaean, what I mean by Manichaean, I mean the fourth century heretic, you know, Mani, you know, uh, light and dark and so, and so on. And no, Ma- Mani, the prophet Mani, I, you know, he was very popular actually. Well, he, he was hugely fashionable in the fifth century. We have a but question um, from the audience. I, uh, I just want to say one thing about Reagan though. It's, um, he was kind of a phony. I'm pretty fucking old too, but um, a phony he was he was really full of shit. I'm I'm actually older than these guys, but uh, he was uh, actually, you know, I thought he was a phony piece of shit, just like I thought Clinton was. But Reagan, I did kind of like buy into his stuff after he got elected. And he he did do some he he really said some good things. And if if he would have like stuck with his uh, rhetoric, he'd have probably, well, probably been pretty cool. The, the man was a star of stage and film. He was a very talented. No, he was a speaker. B actor, and Bill Clinton was a used car salesman. And and people, no. if they fucking buy into those bullshit motherfuckers, I I, I swear Clinton to God, I saw those guys a for the piece of shit that they were. A very from day very one. charismatic speaker, right? But I actually came up here to ask a question. So it, I noticed when you mentioned earlier that your mom had figured out the um you know the impetus behind the start of World War II. You were a guest, and, and it was hard to think about. But imagine for a minute that perhaps the times of World War II, for the people who lived through it, they view it like so many people view 9-11 now. They were like, oh, wow, another bullshit war. How the fuck is anyone going to believe? But 
Now, because these things have been whitewashed through our, our government indoctrination exactly. centers and in our books and right. in our news for so long that all of that knowledge, that was it commonplace or do you think it was truly rare that your mom had insight that most others didn't? I know that the population, I know that a lot of the population was against the war. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, what about two? Coming, in her case, it was very common knowledge in her family. And coming from uh, East, Eastern Kentucky and Appalachia, they had deep suspicions of the government because they remembered the previous generation when they were lied to about the Lusitania, that American ship, the Lusitania, you know, that the, that the dirty Germans sank without warning. Yeah, yeah. Sink. And, and so many Appalachian young men were forced to, you know, in the, with the draft, they had. They didn't. They couldn't find. Well, World War One. Yeah, but it was in the memory of yeah. of the family. Who just you know I, that um, was. The twentieth century sucks so much. <laughs> I, I, it's just I, uh, I just wonder. Um, you know, I've I've heard that uh, a lot of people are against the war and stuff, but but you don't hear about. I don't remember that. You know, I've listened to every one of your podcasts, but I don't remember that particular story. But. You know, you wonder, you know, the, the, the history is written by the victors. I wonder how much of that was just uh, common knowledge that we just lost because we listened to the media. After World War II, there was a strange loss of knowledge on the part of the entire population. And, and partially it's because it was such a trauma. I mean, you, you knew somebody who was dead. You know, you, your whole town was hollowed out, you know, because of, because of the draft. Everybody's on ration tickets. I mean, we were not even um, uh, um, America you know, during World War II. We were some other weird country. You know, uh, John T. Flynn talks about, uh, you know, as we go marching, oh, we're going to beat the fascists, but meanwhile, we're going to become fascists, you know? And so I, I, have, I've, I felt for some time that after the war, there was such a sense of trauma, you know? It's, you, when you ever have something horrible happen to you, you have to kind of suppress it. And you have to yeah, just like, let's, let's, let's move, yeah, let's move on. But we moved on in a strange way that so much so that we forgot so much of that history, we had to suppress it as a culture, as a people. We just kind of put it behind us. Well, in a, in uh, a way. Jeff, okay, so A, uh, you had the most concise point the 20th century has been a complete disaster. But 262 million and counting. So, Not counting um, war. The implications that, okay, so you, you mentioned that, yes, it is a trauma and it's culturally culturally felt, but um, like I'm part of the millennial generation. And I'm not bragging. I'm, uh, there's a lot of problems with millennials. No reason to brag. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, damn. Shots fired. Shots oh. fired. <laughs> I got to, I'm going to have to shut you down, man. <laughs> anyway, um, but like uh, for me, 9-11 was a, it was a traumatic experience. However, I, I will say this of anyone that was born with my timeline and forward. Uh, it's not a particular experience that I think that we feel that generally speaking, and I'm not saying I'm trying to speak for my generation, but um, it doesn't feel like that material to us. In fact, you probably have seen it's on real. No, it, it, it's real, but it doesn't have the emotional yeah. weight behind it. And in fact, you can see on like Facebook, I'm sure you're seeing like, there's a bunch of memes that like, it's our generation mocking 9-11. Mm -hmm. Now you don't see that with Pearl Harbor. There's no memes on Pearl Harbor because there's no internet back then. Right, that's right, that's right. <laughs> you know, one thing though, one thing that didn't happen different from 9-11 say to uh, uh, December 7th, 1941, is that a giant swath of your generation was not forcibly taken and dumped into trenches and killed. Yeah. Well, no, um, we weren't taken, but... Uh, we volunteered. We weren't taken, but at the same time, a, a number of us, and I didn't sign up for it because I wanted to, I signed up because I needed a job. Um, a lot of us did sign up having some sense of patriotism, and a lot of us, it, you know what, it's a 12-year war now? Yeah. Uh, uh, what, in Iraq? Uh, Afghanistan. I don't. I really don't know the math, but whatever it is, it's like 15 years. You, you know, Ben, and and well, uh, the number of people have been around, but the, I have to say, the thing that frustrates me the most about about the current political times, 
and uh, there's, n there's no resolving it. There's no fixing this problem. But, but I came of age uh, in, in a political environment, and I know you're not going to believe anything I'm about, about to tell you. No. Right, <laughs> right, but I'm telling you, this is what's true. The right-wing conservatives in this country were implausibly pro-Islam to an, to an extent that was actually an exaggeration. I know you don't believe anything. Uh, no, I'm that's saying. true. I remember. I know, that. Yeah. yeah I, but Islam is the right wing. Yeah. Religion. Well, you know, in in the 1980s, and please don't instantly get aboard when I said in the 1980s. But I'm just telling you, the the Republicans believed what and what they called the people of the book, and the people of the book were Jews. Christians and Muslims, and we were all united in, in, a, in a coalition against the great enemy, which was, which was secular liberalism, they always said. Secular liberalism is our enemy. That's what's destroying our country. So we have to unite with Islam. And, you know, and, and when I was a, like a, a, you know, a, a, a young professional working at the Senate press gallery, um, uh, the Conservative Caucus, then run by F uh, Howard Phillips, you know, invited me to a luncheon. So I went to the luncheon, and I, I got into the elevator to go up to the, something like the eighth floor of, of the Hotel Washington in those days, and I got onto the elevator with, with a gigantic, stinky man. <laughs> and it was the... He was the most <laughs> horrifying person I ever... Look, I mean, you, you don't want to take a shower, it's fine, but there were negative externalities, I'm telling you. And he was a little bit scary because he was wearing some sort of tribal costume and, and, I, and he smelled of, you know, I don't, couldn't believe I had to go up eight floors of the sky. And whatever, I'm tolerant and broad-minded, whatever, they, thank God I'm going to get off this elevator, it's fine. So, uh, uh, so I got off the elevator, I went to lunch, and it turns out he was the luncheon speaker. And he was a... yeah. <laughs> He was the luncheon. He was the luncheon speaker. He was a member of the Mujahideen, which was the is Islamic fundamentalists that were resisting the the the, the Soviets in, in Afghanistan at the time. And he, he he got up and spoke and he said, <laughs> and then some translator would say, he believes in traditional values <laughs> and limited government. And you know, I I was sitting there thinking. Wait, this isn't. There's something that's sort of vaguely wrong, you know. Like I, you know, I, I you know, I'm, I'm, I'm in favor. Not talking about Bin Laden. <laughs> <laughs> right. No, but of course you understand that Mujahideen became, of course, the uh, Al Qaeda, you know, which then became ISIS. So these are all the same people. So these, the people that we're we're now like radically against, you know, were 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 were, were in in 1985 speakers on the conservative Republican circuit. I mean, that's how crazy the world is. I remember when my little girl was something like seven or something, and I don't know why she wanted to read 1984, but she did. And she came to me, and she said, Dad, this is a very interesting book, but it's just not even believable that within you know, a few days, you know, the regime could change who our friends and enemies are. That's just, that would never happen. <laughs> I said, sweetheart, you're a mere seven. <laughs> Wait till you're 17, 27. <laughs> you will see. It's entirely believable. I tell people all the time, if they haven't read that book, they have to read that book because it comes up so often in our society today. I'm like, oh, that's... From 1984. Wait, and you know 1984 oh was yeah. written. You know, it was a play on 1948. Well, you know what happened in 1948? The Russians are valiant ally in the defeat of fascism in Europe. Suddenly became our mortal enemies. That's the way history unfolds. So, uh, Jeff, um, there's been a lot of historians that have uh, suggested that had not Nazi Germany not existed, Russia, uh, the Soviet Union, would have taken over all of Europe because it, it appears that Stalin had plans and designs on Europe. I think that's sheer fantasy. I, th I think that's sheer fantasy. I, I, that's sheer fantasy. I mean, the whole society was practically bankrupt by that time. I mean, Stalin was a despot. Well, look what happened to Khrushchev, his successor, right? I mean, it was just the guy ended up, he died on a park bench. I mean, this society was already dying. I, I don't, wait, you said that without, wait, did you say without, did you say without Nazi Germany, Russia would have taken over Europe? 
I I have I mean, heard I, no I have heard theories that Russia uh, had designs. No, the, the, I'm telling you, Nazi Germany contributed nothing to the life of Europe. No, but I can just promise you this. I mean, these people were a f- but the monsters. Communi- but the communists were aggressive. You know that. Yeah, but they weren't. They weren't. They didn't, they didn't have any electoral victories. They won an election in Greece in 1948. You don't win one. an election in a communist yeah. state. It <laughs> Well, they didn't, and they did. They did in Greece in 1948. Uh, no, the Russians were no threat to, to, to w- Russia. You know, you know what caused the Russians to take over the Eastern Europe, right? The Nazis. Uh, wait, did I you would say, say that, that the Nazis empowered no, the Russia. The Nazis did not cause Russia to take over Eastern Europe. I would say yeah, because if you know it the wasn't for that question, galvanizing right? it was, it was FDR. Of World War II. FDR put the Russians in Eastern East Germany as a reaction to. The Nazis. No, I'm telling you, the, the, the Nazis. The Nazis were okay. The Nazis were bad. I, I'll just leave it at that. Yeah. Heil Trump. Hey, um, I have a so question though. No, wait, I don't, I don't before know if we, we uh, finished. Um, I know. Uh, Ben's origin story. Yeah, I was gonna say that we have not heard Jeffrey's origin no, story. My origin story is so short. I don't even. It, it'll no, that's all right. Okay, finish Ben's because I, that's why I, I, I interrupted and tried to get this going because I know how we are. There's so much interesting <laughs> shit here. I'll, ra- I'll wrap mine up pretty quickly. Um, first, let me just ta- touch on that. By, by the mid-1930s, the Soviet Union, wa- their economic policies had, had destroyed them and they were eating themselves. I mean, literally, if you look at what happened in Ukraine um, and, and, and echo that out across the rest of the country, it to 1989. Yeah, right. They, yeah, well, they made why it to is, why because. Why the U.S. government still alive? <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh-huh. uh, ben, so, but the thing is, um, and I think, uh, Jeff, I'm a fellow economist. My buddy Joe here is a fellow economist. Government is very, very, right. very effective right. at marshaling resources. So, right yes. Right so. <laughs> Uh, the communist, is, uh, you know, a communist state is extremely effective at marshaling resources. So it, it doesn't really make, it doesn't really necessarily dictate that. Uh, they can marshal them, but the problem is they, they don't know they, how to separate they, they marshal a whole shit ton of steel, <laughs> but they, do, they need aluminum for what they're trying to do. <laughs> yeah, and so not only can they marshal resources, but they, they can marshal human capital very effectively. And that's what the FBI does, that's what the CIA does, that's what the federal government does. So it's not, I am not convinced necessarily that, yes, uh, a central state planning committee, it will fail over time. But if you look at the slavery that happened like in Egypt, they, mi- they made giant pyramids and all from a central dictator. So Yeah, but then their economy collapsed. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we've, we've got awesome pyramids to show for it, right? Go ahead and finish your origin story, and I can tell mine very, very, very briefly because mine's so, uh, mine's so short. Okay, so I was slamming Ronald Reagan. Um, <laughs> so I heard these just beautiful words coming out of Ronald Reagan's empty head, and and I was, it was like, if you ever seen Young Frankenstein when he hears the music in the in the background? No, we're we're way too young for that. <laughs> I'm not. I've I never remember. Seen it either, all right? <laughs> and 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 the creature is like, he hears this music and he and he can't think. He just starts going like this at the sky, like, what is this? What's happening? And he's lured towards it. And that's what Ronald Reagan did to people like me. But by 1988, um, a moth toward the light. Yeah, <laughs> I was so uh, enthralled with his words, but disappointed by his uh, actions that I thought, okay, well, here it is. Here's what has to happen. I have to get in there in the Republican Party and, f- and do my part to fix, fix this thing. So I was a stand-in get delegate to, in 1988 to the Republican National Convention. And they pulled, a, there was a small group of us from Southern California that were kind of a coalition that were all gonna get together and kind of disrupt their plans to put uh, uh, Papa Bush into office. And uh, they basically took this small group of us into one hotel room and they said, now this is how it's gonna be. You're gonna do, yeah. <laughs> you're gonna do exactly what everybody else is gonna do and we're gonna put Bush in 
and you're not going to have a voice in this because if you do have a voice in it, you'll be removed from the floor and you'll be replaced so fast nobody will even know you were ever there. Are, are you telling me that uh, you don't have a voice in representation? Oddly <laughs> enough. <laughs> and I was so upset with that that I literally tore up my Republican membership card and went home in frustration before the, the convention. And I got home and I expressed my frustration to a libertarian friend of mine and he's like, well, have you heard Sorry. the good news of St. Of Saint Paul? <laughs> and so I started learning about, you know, Ron Paul. And this was like coming right up towards the convention for uh, 88. And I started learning all about Ron Paul and started reading his stuff and, and it was like the light came on and, I was, and it, here he is descending from the clouds, this great man that will save us. Um, I think it was mostly, he was asking, what were you reading? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, what were you reading of Ron Paul's? I'm just curious. Um, I th yeah, I, there w it actually was. It was the newsletters, and, and there was some kind of pamphlets that the that libertarians were passing out at the time. Yeah, interesting. And, um, and, oh, and the other thing was I learned for the first time about Ron Paul's uh, um, work in trying to get Fort Knox audited. Uh, but I didn't see at that time that that was a hoax and it didn't actually happen. So then we went into it in 88, and, and I totally believe that Ron Paul, not, I didn't think he could win the presidency as a libertarian, but I thought he was going to make this giant impact, which didn't happen. And at the end of that, you're talking about as of when today, I think he has. But, but wait, you were talking about when he was, he was actually nominated by the Libertarian yeah, Party. Yeah, yeah, he was the, he was and the he party. he ran for president yeah. in 1988 yeah. as, as, a, as, a, as the nominee of the Libertarian Party, Ron Paul. Right. Yeah. And at the end of that, I was very disillusioned and very saddened, and uh, I was very upset with the Libertarian Party because the, it seemed like they had this great chance, and they just blew it. You know, not necessarily to win the presidency, but to make a big enough statement to get attention and become a serious third party. And so I just became kind of a political, um, uh, like I like a I don't carry in. You became you know? Ben Stone. Yeah. <laughs> and it and and I put my head down. And I went to work, and I started just trying to make as much money as I could for my kids. Get into agorism. Get, don't be licensed. Just try to get some money. Try to earn a living. And I did that for years until my daughter, my oldest daughter, got to the age of where she started poking me with questions. And because she knew that I had a certain level of morals that I lived by, and I had never, uh, uh, I had never tried to force my morals on my kids, but I had always tried to live my morals for my kids. And, um, and I, I, I made it a point to never lie to my kids. Like, I, never, even if they ask me something that makes me look really bad, I'll tell them the truth. Because I think that's more important than what your image is. It's more important that you're truthful with your kids so that they can trust you. I agree with that. So this ratty little girl that I love so much would pin me with questions, moral questions, specifically about the state, that, that I was forced to look at and say, yeah, there's nothing within the political process that is moral. And, and she would, night after night, we would sit, uh, we had a little campfire or a, a, a backyard a fire pit behind our house. And night after night, we would sit back there and talk, and she would have little questions that she would pin me with. And, you know, Example? Uh, not really. <laughs> but it, it would be things like, like uh, is, is voting moral? Okay, well sure, it's more voting is self-defense. That would be my argument. And then we'd go through all the steps and she'd say, well, where did the government get the money for the election? Where did the, money get the, mo where did the government get the money for the ballots? Where did the money, where did the money come from to, uh, to have the lawyers write out the, the you know? And, and she would pick apart each thing like this and just force me to face the facts. And by the time she got done, I was, and, and then 2008, uh, yeah, 2008 came along, and Ron Paul came back up out of the ashes, and I was so excited, I, I had to do something about this. So I put aside everything that my daughter had forced me to learn, and I went down there, and I registered as a Republican again, like I said I would never do. Yeah, and I voted in the primary, and the day that I went in and voted, 
I went in there, I showed my identification, told him my address, got my thing, went over there, voted for Ron Paul, 2008, and as soon as I handed him back the card, I felt filthy. I felt like a thousand showers couldn't get me clean. So I, I have to ask you, because you voted for Ron Paul, and uh, I actually like Ron Paul very much. He's, he's done, I think he's done a great uh, service for the libertarian anarchy community in general. But you must have realized, and I'm, uh, you must have realized that voting is complete bullshit. At that moment, I knew it. Before, I suspected it. So, uh, was it your daughter, Kai? Yeah, yeah. And um, I just was wondering for a few years, uh, how did you come up with that name? Uh, she made it up, yeah. Her, oh, it's actually, like, in the womb, or you didn't? <laughs> no, I'm no we, we gave her one name, and by the time she was early teens, she had decided that she had a different name. Cool. And so she was a um, pretty uh, amazing child. Uh, we got called to the junior high. There was a brief uh, for part of the time we homeschooled part of the time we unschooled, but the name hadn't been invented yet. And then for a brief time, uh, we had to use public school. And she was in the eighth grade and uh, we got a call from the from the principal's office that we needed to come down and talk to them. And we went down there. We didn't know what was going on. And they said, um, your daughter has been spreading anarchist material <laughs> and, and putting it on all the bulletin boards in the school. And... <laughs> this is one of those moments. <laughs> I'll do a shot. <laughs> and, and I had to admit to the principal that I had printed it for her. But, but, but truly, I mean, parents, parents here need, need to, uh, you'll understand exactly what I mean. It was one of the saddest, strangest moments of my life when I had to reveal to my sweet little girl the existence of the state. You know, because they, they can't possibly understand it, you know. They're born into a world of anarchy, right? I mean, th there's sweet, sweet mom, sweet dad, siblings, whatever. I mean, th their whole world is, is anarchy. They get to make choices. They do the, the thing or whatever. And then one day, I don't know, something happens. So they hear some news or something. And something happens and they're like, Daddy, you know, what is the president? And why is he... Why is he Somehow so in charge of <laughs> us. Well, sweet girl, yeah, he steals like a third of my income. <laughs> Otherwise, I would have bought you uh, that little pink truck, you know, that, that, that Dana was talking about. You know, uh, there's a lot of things I would have done for you, but, but he's somehow in charge. And, and there's another gang of people around him, and they live, yeah, that it's true, they live very far away. And well, Daddy, why, why are they, how come they are able to steal our stuff? And why are they telling us what to do? And, and then you're stumped, really. You know, it's like, well, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, what are you going to say? You're going to tell them the story of the social contract? You're going to resort, resort to, you know, to, to, to Rousseau or something? I don't know. There's no real good answer for this. So it's no harder than the where do babies come from? <laughs> yeah, right, no, I'm sex is no problem at all. So government, that's really implausible. So can I ask you guys, uh, it's, it's, uh, and I want you to kind of like uh, think deeply about this for a moment because understand what I'm trying to imply. Uh, I know you've been drinking and it's fine, I don't care. It's, it's something that I've been kind of thinking about uh, the last few years. Um, do you see, do you see the, uh, the globe as a bunch of, and I mean by nations or countries, if you will, do you see them as all like anarchist communities? I see them as the uh, the the governments themselves. You're saying within geographical, or the or the cultural peoples. I guess I guess the cultural, because uh, like when I look at the United States, for example, um, you know it has a lot of influence. And but the interesting thing about the United States is that. Um, it has so much foreign influence, yet there is, yes, there, there, is, there is a president that runs it, and there's a Congress that runs it, but the interesting thing to me about it is that it doesn't, 
it seems like this is what happens when you have enough communities that have enough momentum um, and while they may consider themselves individualist at the very, very, very local level, mm-hmm. at the higher levels, they tend to kind of agree amongst each other. There are many nations in the United States. However, the government is trying to beat it into our head that we are one nation. Under God, indivisible, <laughs> well, I'd like to hear for liberty speech. and justice. Uh, let, let, let me just say something that you won't believe, but I'm just going to say it anyway. <laughs> I don't believe you. No, you're not going to believe it, uh, especially lying. in the age of, of, of the alt-left and the alt-right and all the rest of the yeah, idea yeah, yeah. of okay. <laughs> Yeah, I believe that every individual human being on the planet Earth is deserving of rights and freedom and the aspiration of full dignity that befits their status as a child of God. I believe that. Period. I, uh, I agree, except uh, I don't really believe in God, but I don't really care. Yeah, that's loud or anything. No. I'm just saying. <laughs> but, but, you know, I, I said this earlier. No, no, no. Let's not bring that. No. <laughs> No, but no, that's cool. Please erase that from the tape. No, I believe that uh, anarchists, I said this earlier, but anarchists are really, really believe in people. You know, we, we, we come off as like negative because we like hate the government so much, but we really truly believe in individuals' power, um, c- capability to govern themselves. We believe that people are, are, are smart. We believe in good people. Can I just tell you a quick story? I mean, this is very interesting. And I will tell you here. And Ben, you need to listen to this, all right? Because I'm telling you what's true. And, and I don't care how many tweets I get that tell me I'm a liar. I love you guys. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So let me. Eat some kiwi things. No, I understand. No, I. I love you, man. I'm right. Okay. No, I get it. But. So can I, let me just tell you a quick a quick story, okay? So I'm with Mary Ro- I'm with Mary Rothbard, and for the first time we're now meeting with or these people called the Paleoconservatives, and there was a meeting in um, in <laughs> no <laughs> no what <laughs> no in in, in uh, Rockford, Illinois, and it was with Paul Gottfried, you know, the famous you know Schmidt scholar, and you know all these various alt right, you know, what would later become the alt right, and it was after one hour. Of, of visiting with these people. And I was kind of young and a little naive and, and kind of excited about the idea of a coalition with, with conservatives. And Mary Rothbard, uh, we spilled out of the first meeting, and I said, Mary, this is very exciting. Um, I think these people are with us because they hate the welfare state and they're, they're against the global war, uh, warfare state and, and, and uh, democratic imperialism. Uh, can't we work with them? And Mary, Mary Rothbard said to me, No, this, this is actually, no, I'm telling, okay, I didn't, I, d- I never recorded this remark, right? So you can, you can say, oh, well, you're, f- you're full of shit or whatever, but I'm just telling you, this is what I remember. He said, Jeffrey, we can never work with these people. We can never work with them. I said, why? He said, because they don't believe in universal rights. And I personally felt a sense of like, Oof, really? Well, a sense of like, well, they, they seem nice and they have the right positions that, th- that, that agree with us. Why can't we? But Murray's instincts were very good. There's no foundation. There's no foundation. He said they don't believe in universal rights. And I, I'm haunted by this. And you know why, right, Ben? Uh, but I, I was, I'm haunted by this to this day. Because I remember sitting on that small bench in that, in that, uh, that hallway with Murray. And we had come a long way for this meeting. And he was now saying that this whole plot that we had hatched was, full of, w- was never going to work because these people don't believe in universal rights. And that's the bare minimum we have to believe in. And I remember being sad, thinking, oh, Jesus, Murray, you're such an ideologue. Why don't you go along? And you know what's strange about the history is complex. Here's what's strange. Murray, <laughs> Jane, I don't know if he, 
He went with it. He went all in. I, two years or three years later, was out completely. So, so I have to ask you, Jeffrey, are, are you saying that minorities and uh, women should have rights? Yeah, I know it's, <laughs> a, I know it's absurd. But I, I more or less believe that. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> but, um, Listen, I, I think, you know what I think? I think, I think Murray's instincts were right. I think, he was, I think he was right about this. I mean, he sniffed them out. I mean, he, he understood that these people don't, really don't believe in anything universal. They don't believe in really truth. I think this brings us back to the but topic at the very start of this show. And, and I think the, the division that, that we see within the anarchy community today is that people are afraid that some other some some of the people calling themselves anarchists may not be fully um, anarchists may, may no, no may not be fully um, based on a foundation of universal principles universal principles you know I it's very hard for me. This is a very hard topic for me, like personally, because I think at that period, and we're talking about like, I think 1989, 1990, I think I had, I had wrongly come to believe that we should be in a coalition with everybody who favors our same po political views. Um, and, and I was a little bit devastated that Murray, the abstract uh, uh, philosopher, would have told me that he could smell something wrong. He could discern that there was something. And I didn't want to believe it because I wanted to have friends. I wanted to have a coalition, you know? And, and, and re in retrospect, I, you understand that there's certain things that happen to us in life that haunt us forever. Yeah, that, trauma. right? That moment haunts me to this day. Murray was right. And I, as a, you know, a child, I, I should have, I should have said, Murray, what, what do you mean? Uh, tell me more. I, I should, instead, my instinct was to, to go, stop talking that way, you're ruining everything. <laughs> you know? You're ruining everything, Murray. Don't, don't tell me about your, your weird ideological problems you have with these people. And may... <laughs> You know, and maybe if I had, maybe if I at that moment had been smarter and more sophisticated and more mature, you know, I, 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 I would have said, Mary, together, why don't you and I resist this? Because this could be a thing, and maybe it shouldn't be a thing. Maybe, maybe liberty is the thing. And help me. Be my mentor. I will be your ally, and together we will resist the left and right. This is what should have happened. I failed him. I failed myself at that moment. I did. I, th I think, um, well, no, I think um, he succeeded uh, wildly because you are right here connecting with all of us. We are, like, hearing everything you say, and we are absorbing it. And no, no, we, <laughs> no, because, you know, the, it looks like you really grow question. through failure or whatever. So, so, so people weren't ready for your message at that time that you think you should have said, but I think we're ready for it now. I want to give that, I, 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 I'm sure I did an imperfect job tonight. And I, and I, no, I'm. No, I mean, but I want, I want to, that message that I, 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 that Murray gave me that night, I want to, to convey to you and to this current generation, like desperately, desperately. We, we have a question from the audience. I actually don't have a question. I actually have a statement. Okay. Um, uh, what you relay to us is simply a preparation for a given time, for later, it's not a vision um, of the it's future. it begins with that vision yes but what it is when we miss opportunities that we look back on it's always 2020 however there's preparation 
for you to become at a different time. And that's part of what all the vision is about when different people come and they hear something and it's like I heard you say you floundered for years. I'm, you know, and a lot of us find ourselves in the position of floundering uh, at a given time, but that time is not for us. We're just simply being prepared to be able to do some at a different time. Just like um, one person may be actively able to do something today, it may be four years from now that what is supposed to be your role comes to fruition in any kind of a movement. It's just like these are people who are part of what the established thing is that we want to present, but over a period of time, what will happen, it will be people among the people who are sitting here who will be very powerful in leading us toward things that we want. You gotta That's wonder, all I wanted um, to say. I mean, to me, these guys are somewhat of prophets. They brought me a lot of knowledge. You know, is it 10 years or 100 years from now? Are these going to be, be really, like, uh, you know, special cares, people? Who, I don't care about, about personally, who, but no, the no, message, though. No, right. The, mes the message is what's matter. I mean, really, don't care, don't care about Ben. Don't care about me. I mean, uh, really, none of us matter. Uh, uh, no, it's true. No, it's, you know, what's, you know what matters? You know, what, you know what's powerful? What lasts the ages? And which, which animates humanity, which drives forward history, is, is the idea. And, and this idea of human liberty, you may interpret it one way, you another. Everyone in this room, it turns out, interprets liberty in a different way. And, 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 and that's okay, because you know, ideas are immortal. But you know what's weird about, about, about the idea of human liberty? It's, 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 um, it takes a different form in every human mind here. And that's precisely why we need all of us to have rights. And you know what? That doesn't create chaos. That creates um, harmony. Just like this conference. You know, there's a beautiful harmony that exists among all of us here tonight. And we will never forget it. We're going to be changed as a result of this experience together. Even though we don't agree necessarily, God forget, God forbid, right? We're all different people. But there's something, something harmonious about the people in this small space. But extrapolate this small space to the country, to the continent, to the globe, to all of human history. All of us, as living human beings, have the capability and the capacity to learn from each other, to be valuable to each other, provided we have a template of freedom. And then we flourish as long as we live on this earth. And we can, we can work to leave the, to, for our own freedom, but also to leave the world a freer place for all generations that follow. To me, that's what, that's, you know why you're here? Because something, for whatever reason, has touched you to work for this cause. That makes you the most important people on the planet, as far as I'm concerned. In some way, all of you is going to change history, each and every one of you, in imperceptible, beautiful, shocking, awesome ways. Every one of you. You don't have to be famous. You don't have to write books. You don't have to be a fucking celebritarian or whatever this word is. It doesn't <laughs> matter. It doesn't matter. Each of you in your own way will, will, will change. You, every one of you is, is the black swan. You know, the person who will make a difference in the world. Every one of you has been touched and graced with knowledge. And more importantly than just abstract knowledge, you have passion. You have love. For, for where you are and what you're doing. And, and, and that's what's going to drive history forward. And if you do that, your life will be well lived. Okay. Can I get an I, I love you guys? <laughs> that was a great, that was great. So uh, Jeff, I, want, I really want to agree with you, but I'm, I'm somewhat of a cynic. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. So, um, 
couple questions. Well, I, I, no, 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 you know, you know, um, I want to believe what you say, and it, it's a, it's, it's a good speech, it is, but um, I also realize that I believe it, Jeffrey. Um, I also realize that most human beings they're born into the world in a very damaged way. Uh, they're they, not they, they, born they, in a damaged way; they are damaged sometime after they're born. Well, yeah, after they're born. Okay, so let's go with that. Um, and it 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 is offensive to upset someone's um, sense of like this is this is a this is a real like thing. Um, as far as I can tell, both both of you are um, both of you are religious. Am, uh, am I correct? Yeah. So. So here's the thing. So, <laughs> badcatholic.com. Personally, personally, me, I don't believe in God. I think God is a, uh, it's, in my opinion, it's a silly concept. Shut up, heathen. But anyway, <laughs> the interesting thing about anarchy uh, to me and the anarchist concept is that how do you, how do you go about promoting an I I ideology that um, is so small and it's so hard-headed uh, to a mass population that th they don't really they can't conceive of society without you know government roads and right. government health care and I, I i want i really want more people to be libertarians and anarchists but i i look at the math i look at the data i look at the numbers i'm like I'm not sure that we can ever achieve that. And I'll, I'll, and I'll, I'll, I'll extrapolate on this. I have to say, and you may disagree with me, and you're welcome to, uh, the United States Constitution is arguably uh, one of the, I'm not saying it's a good document. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying it's a good document. But when I look at it, uh, from a there are lessons of liberty kind of built into it yes. a little bit. Yes. That kind of help to guide people to resist the state in I a little I bit. With both perspectives. I mean, uh, on one hand, you know, y you're right about the Constitution. In some ways, it was a liberal document. On the other hand, it created a government. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I, I mistake. <laughs> mistake. The best government of all time. <laughs> it Reaganized. USA. USA. <laughs> The Constitution was the late 1700s version of Ronald Reagan. It had, it had all the right buzzwords, it had all the good feeling, and it slammed you with the drug war. Well, Jeffrey did make the, the, the very important point that it created something that didn't exist before. But what, what, yeah, the what I was bringing was, up was is great, just that yeah. there are certain things in it that tell people that people have right, like, like say take the Second Amendment, for example. It doesn't claim to grant you a right. It says the right. So yeah. it's saying that the right exists, and it's, it's in a sense, it's teaching people. Right. So on the one hand, it's this tyrannical thing that created this horrible power, but on the other hand, it also teaches people that there are these rights out there. Yeah, well, the, the Bill of Rights saved, in some sense, the Constitution, or, or maybe corrupted it entirely, because it was only the Bill of Rights that led the Anti-Federalists to finally, uh, you know, agree to it, to, yes. to, to agree to it. What, one um, of the things I like to say is tragedy. that Tragedy, the, really the, Constitution. The, the Bill of Rights was put in there to get otherwise resistant people to acquiesce to new power. Yeah, yeah no, it's, 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 that's, that's really true. Yeah. I mean, uh, really, uh, the, if you take nothing away, uh, uh, else away from, t from tonight or, the, or, this, or this conference, uh, <laughs> we, we, we don't need a government, okay? So let me just say that, you know, I would just lay it out. We don't actually need a government. What happens then? Nah, I don't know. But, but it'll be better than what would otherwise happen with the state. So, I have to ask you a question, Jeffrey, and you too, Ben. Um, yeah, we're gonna wrap up very quickly. Have you guys been investigated by the FBI? <laughs> no, no. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm just, I'm gonna put out there. I have been, and it was a very intense oh, yeah, interrogation. Yeah. No, I, I've dealt, I've dealt. Actually, I have dealt personally with the FBI. And uh, let me just say for the record, I do not work for the CIA. Traitor. <laughs> <laughs> I find this accusation, which is widespread, to be outrageous All right. and, and offensive. 
So I'll say again, I do not work for the CIA. So I say this all the time to promote the idea that I'm actually CIA, because I think you look would, like CIA. Yeah, I am CIA. <laughs> so um, because I think it would be, you know, people tend to think it's sort of awesome and you know prestigious or something. So I, I tend to promote it. No, but I have I have dealt with the FBI. Tucker. At, at Jeffrey great. Tucker. I have I have actually extensive experience with the FBI and um, yeah. I mean, so we don't need to go into it, but yes, no, no. absolutely. Jeff, Jeff, I got to tell you this. And uh, Ben, I think you're going to find this amusing, both of you. So uh, about four years back, uh, I was employed by HP, Hewlett Packard. Yeah. So um, part of my I job. I want to talk to you about my printer. <laughs> <laughs> so, so part of my job was to investigate uh, government accounts that HP held, right? So um, I su uh, they they sent me uh, I forget what the doc the type of document it is, but um, they said you need to like you know show us your entire work history and how long you've lived there and all that shit. And um, so I um, I told them immediately off the bat, no. And then about six months later, I uh, got an email, and they filled out all the information for me. <laughs> and then, yeah, of course. And so then um, another six months go by, and they're like, okay, you're approved for S, I think it's SF or SP or SPFF. Uh, Some kind of alphabet soup of a, of a yeah, credit. Yeah, it's an alphabet soup uh, approval. Yeah, and they're like, yeah, you can look over government documents. I'm like, I've been doing this for like the last <laughs> year. <laughs> and the interesting thing about it was that when the Fed showed up at my house, it was uh, December 20th, 2014, if I recall correctly. And they were asking me, like, do you have any intentions of killing a president? Or, you know, do you, do you have any intentions of building a weapon? And I'm like, I, <laughs> and I was like, I built a potato garden, <laughs> and they thought, are you going to fire it on the White the, 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 the question they asked me was, are you going to fire it on the White House? I was like, no, <laughs> not at all. So it, it is interesting to me that uh, the level of stake, uh, the level of stake you can play with the government, it, they, they take all of it very seriously, and I don't necessarily see, like, I can't even have like a dark joke with them. Like I can't. You are the king of dark jokes that get you banned from places, though. Yeah. Danny. But I, all I'm saying is that um, if if you've been investigated by the FBI, so have I. Um, and I'm I'm not trying to promote this thought or topic, but um, you guys have already, uh, you know, you've kind of lived your lives out. I'm still young, <laughs> and it is very intimidating when the Fed show up at your house. Well, you know, the, the most important thing that, uh, that, uh, that we anarchists can remember uh, about dealing with the state is that we tend to be fearful, and I think it's mostly illusory. They Fear want us to be fearful. They want you to be fearful. You don't, 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 don't be afraid. Um, oh, you yeah, be, they be don't go to jail. No, right. I, I get that, but, you know, but if they want you to be afraid. Don't be fearful. Uh, it's quite often the case that with a little bit of courage, you can be, you can live a, a free life, and you can, you can, you can be freer than you otherwise would. And and no, and and a lot of times, um, the fear is an illusion, and 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 it's an illusion we impose on ourselves, yes. you know. And 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 that's well, what, there was a statistic about the Stasi of people, like half of the population thought they had a report, but it turned out it was only ten. No, no, right. I mean, like you that. just just resist resist authority. What can I tell? You? Be smart, but resist authority. I mean, every day I wake up and just say, I'm, I'm going to be, uh, 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 I'm going to live free, and I'm going to resist the authority. I don't know how exactly that works out in your life, but it's absolutely essential that if you let fear consume you, it's a big problem in the libertarian world. You know, we, we discover the state, and we're like, oh, shit, that thing is terrible. And then we, then we hide forever, and that's the end of our lives. That is not the, a good way to be a good, solid liberal. You have to fight. You have to live big. You have to be aggressive. You have to be courageous, really, and, and hopeful. I think we're, uh, we're uh, living our free life right now. Yes. I don't think there's any FBI agents in here, but if you are, 
fuck you. <laughs> but, um, if, but hey, we're, we're doing what we want to do, and we're learning and living a free life. Yeah, so, we're, we're going to um, wrap up. Yeah, we're, we're going to kill it very yeah. soon. But be, before very we wrap soon. up the show, Jeffrey said that his origin story is really oh, short. So, short. Oh. so let, let's yeah, hear it. We haven't it. heard it. I we'll wrap up. So just really quickly, it was mostly an intellectual conversion. I've been an economist and and working and just trying to figure. Yeah, and I just an economic. economist. No, I know. Is that like an, an e, e economist? E-commerce or uh, e-communist? The problem was that I was trying to figure out like what exactly is the role of the state, and I kept unraveling it a little bit at a time. And at they some point, I couldn't think of anything that that the state needed to do. That that uh, that that could do well that needed to be done in the social order, right? So I was like, what the, what what the hell, the state? And I, I and and I was consumed by it because I did not want to be an anarchist, right? This is a little bit of a leap. You've all been through it. A little bit of a hump. So I so I went to Murray Rothbard and I said, Murray, I have a sense. Tell me if I'm wrong and what this implies. That there's nothing the state can do better than society itself that needs to be accomplished and so therefore we need I, therefore there's nothing for the state to do so in which case it should just go away I think does that make me an anarchist and Murray said to me yes Jeffrey you're an anarchist <laughs> and he jumped forward five feet and shook my hand vigorously and gave me a hug and I thought, oh shit, I'm an anarchist for life now. <laughs> so that's how it happened. I watched this, this TV series by um, Milton Friedman. It was based on his book, Free to Choose. It was like a 10 hour series on PBS. And in this series, Milton Friedman makes this awesome case for anarchy for 10 hours. And then he has to say, but I'm not an anarchist because he wasn't. Yeah, and that's yeah. That was the the Before we shut everything down, I want to publicly reveal something about Jeffrey that nobody else knows. Oh, you know, oh he was you're talking about him? his. He was talking about his. <laughs> he was talking about his CIA alle- allegations and what what Jeffrey's goal actually is. He knows that the CIA is so disjointed and backwards, and they're so bad at doing what it is they do that if they keep hearing often enough that, S- that Jeffrey is an agent of the CIA, they're actually going to issue him a check. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take it. Do you, do you have time for a quick photo? Uh, uh, yeah. Well, yes, yes, yes. But uh, I want to ask just one last question before we uh, kill you, tonight. You can just come, you can just come back. Oh, oh damn. Okay, no, I'll be back. Jeffrey will be back. He has to take a brief break. And then when he comes back, we will wrap up the show and uh, say good night. Ben, um, you haven't been talking enough, and uh, <laughs> I, I, I just, uh, you're, you know, when I first got into this, after I uh, literally um, met all these people at a Jeffrey Tucker speech, uh, 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 uh. anyway, I listened to every one of your podcasts, and uh, I'm just really happy you're here, and um, say wow. something. I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. He's not a giant. He's normal. Yeah, I'm just a normal size fag. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, wait a minute. I'm normal size. Yeah, <laughs> Fuck you. You admitted it finally. Okay. <laughs> oh, uh, I don't know what to say. Um, it is pretty neat to be here, and I'll just fill some space fluffing everybody because it's just really cool to be here in Michigan and. and you know, the whole, uh, to get back, it's been how many years? Four or five years since I was at this? Four uh, years. Four years? The year and, I did not come. And when I was here the last time, I was, like, physically exhausted. And so I, I kind of just hung out next to my car and didn't do anything. But you guys were so welcoming, and, and it was just so nice to come here and just relax and listen to other people talk and not be expected to do anything. It was like I was on vacation. And and that was really needed, and I really appreciated that. I haven't really got to say that to the to the uh, Midwest Peace and Liberty co- uh, Coalition, but um, what did I say? Four years ago? Five years ago? 
You guys gave Fuck me the week of vacation that I needed. I love interacting with you because uh, as a young economist, and this is a mid-economist, like economist, and you are like a full-blown economist, <laughs> it, no, you, you present very interesting arguments. However, I will say this. Um, I, I kind of wonder, because I've noticed your uh, pattern lo uh, lately on the internet and all that shit, it, and you, you actually, tr in your your talk earlier tonight was uh, the uh, reintroduction of liberalism. The, and I, the reclaiming the term. Yeah. I agree with you on that, but um, it, it, that seems to me, and I'm not trying to be crude, yeah. um, it's, like tr it's like trying to revive the, the feminist label. Like it, it, It's become so toxic lately why try? I mean, like, why not? Yeah, I'll, t I'll tell you why. It really, truly matters. Oh, you mean you're talking about the liberal label? Well, let me just say that in 1929, Mises wrote a book called Liberalismus, and 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 he yes, he was the last guy. You know, the 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 you know, right? Everybody thought he was like some sort of reactionary or old-fashioned dude, and blah blah blah. And and nobody read the book. Nobody cared. When the book came to be reprinted in 1954, um, he acquiesced to the demand that we called the Free and Prosperous Commonwealth. And then when, it, when the second edition of that book came out, he said, you know what, fuck it. It's got to be called liberalism. It's the only word. I don't get, uh, mostly I don't care about terminology. But this word, it's our word. It's a holy word. It's a sacred word. It's our word because it, yeah, oh, well, okay, right, oh, well, anarchism is, is fine. I, look, I have no problem. Anarchism, this is my second choice. I, I, uh, it was actually my first choice. But, but even, at, uh, you know, so uh, among our friends, I, I have no problem using the term anarchist because I, I truly am an anarchist. But by the way, I, I don't even like, I particularly like the term anarcho-capitalist because I, I think it, it presumes a kind of a predetermined result. I believe in capital. I believe in private ownership and I believe, you know, all these things. But, but you, it, don't in I, you know that I do. No, but I, 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 I but, but, I, but I, I prefer anarchists because it, what we need is a, is a blank template of, of, of freedom. We just, need, we just need rights and freedom to be, and to be left alone, and we'll, we'll be able to figure out the rest. And I, you know, whatever the results of that are, are, are infinitely better than any predetermined result. I, I'm so convinced of that. I, I'm thoroughly convinced. Um, uh, so, you know, and, and, but, but another thing I'm convinced of is that, that the views that are, uh, that are alive in this room are the culmination or, and the maturation of a half a millennium of work on behalf of human liberation against authority. That's who we are. Yes, we have a, a slightly more advanced view than Milton Friedman, right? And, and uh, we're better than John Locke, I, you know. We probably make other different mistakes, but we've been growing for 500 years, and it all and and, and the result is what you see around you, you know, a, a a conviction that that we can manage the world better than any of the ruling class can possibly do with power, and 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 so in that sense, I I believe that we should market ourselves as the f f the, the 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 end state of of liberalism, the fin de siècle. Okay, so. Well, generally speaking, I agree with you. Would you say that um, private property is the most liberation act? Well, private property was a brilliant technology that had to be developed to prevent the starvation of humanity. Okay, so uh, does, <laughs> I, does IP qualify as private property? Of course property? not. <laughs> You're not going to get a yes on it. I, I, I think... No, I love it, man. I love it, man. <laughs> No, I, 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 th I, I think we you. I think we need to wrap up the show right there because we can probably talk for the next 16 hours. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, um, I think you know the terminology uh, liberals, <laughs> capitalists. You know we have to be careful when we're talking because most of our arguments are about definitions. We are not actually talking about the same thing. I don't know if James Weeks is out there, but no, we've often fucked that. He has different <laughs> definitions for but words. But 
you spoke about the you know definition of liberalism the definition of capitalism and caps it, it's a problematic word and many of us oh, have don't a give me that liberal bullshit. many of us have a, a problem with the word anarchist and i i i prefer the word voluntarist but i i i willfully identify as an anarchist but most people are triggered literally triggered by the word anarchist so that's it. That's because they've Sometimes been taught be a, a good false thing, derivative definition of the word anarchist. Look, I, I've, been to or plenty not. Of, I've been to plenty of cocktail parties where you know nobody knows who I am or something like that. And, and the, they're like, well, so what are your politics? And I say, look, I, I just don't. It, it, politics is not really my thing. I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, an, I'm an anarchist. And, you know, that causes them to be interested, right? I mean, you want to shut, up, shut down a conversation, call yourself a Republican or a Democrat. Yeah. You know, that'll oh, shut it sure. down. If you call yourself an anarchist, say, well, no, that sounds, that's intriguing. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. Tell me more. You know, so it can, be, it can be very good. It can be very good. Actually. I find that the word voluntarist does gather Volunt up. Vo well, yeah, it, but then it, it, it can it be a little didactic. Conversation. You know, that was a, you know, did you know that the word volunteer, voluntarist was very popular in, in Victorian England, actually? Uh, really? it w yeah, it was uh, it was the Liberal Party uh, at at the late in the late 18, 1890s had um, rallied around um, the thinker Auburn Herbert. I don't know if you've ever heard of him, but he was he was a, a great voluntarist and and I think some of the most brilliant writings in our tradition. Nobody's heard of him. I'm convinced this guy didn't market himself well because his name sucked. I mean, do you want to love Auburn Herbert? I mean, that's just a weird name, Auburn Herbert. I think that's why we haven't heard about him actually. <laughs> but, he, but he was a great writer. I'm sorry about his name. He should have changed his but name like his you know, your daughter. But uh, it should have been somebody else like Ayn Rand or something like that. But, but um, it was. Don't, don't shit on Ayn Rand. No, no. I love I Ayn adore Rand. Ayn Rand. I I'm just saying Ayn Auburn Rand. Herbert is not a very good name. But his writings are brilliant. And, and voluntarism, he, he, he made it popular briefly. He was, I think, he like a member of parliament, wasn't he? Something like that. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, yeah, yeah. I generally an identify as a, liber uh, as a voluntarist. But how can you disagree with the, the statement? All human interaction should be voluntary. And um, right. I mean that, that's right. I mean, how can anybody disagree with that? I mean, it's funny because you know the guy, the the um, sweet, loving, pious Pope, um, the other day uh, uh, made a statement that was clearly directed me. I n I have no doubt about it because he cited my book that's in Spanish. And I quoted back to him a statement from Dignitatis Humanae, Vatican II statement on religious liberty, that said the following. It said, uh, uh, no person should be coerced against his or her conscience in any matter of thought or action. Who said that? V Vatican II, the Council of the no Catholic way. Church. So, yeah. And, and uh, so I quoted this back to the Pope, you know, uh, just like, oh, by the way, here's what you're supposed to believe. Uh, successor to Peter, you know. Um, uh, but it's a brilliant statement from Vatican II. It II. is, really. Yeah, wow. it's, a brilli it's a brilliant statement. So um, I think uh, I would like to keep going on for like about two days. But I, <laughs> I would t I'm really, you know, we haven't done a show for a few months, and then I get, you know. Ever. So two, I would two like days we're gonna need more rum. Yeah, I would like <laughs> we have lots of rum, but I would like Ben Stone, I would like you to close the show out, say something. Uh, hmm. Yeah, something. Say something. That's <laughs> something. a really good question. Oh, close it off, ben. Something, something. Oh no, no. Jeff and uh Ben should uh close it off. One question. Have you guys ever been on together? Oh yeah. Uh, oh really? Like doing a show together yeah. you're talking about. Really Spe specifically, <laughs> specifically talking on together. On a drug, in public, I meant. Right? Yeah, I know. I meant on a drug. Ben's played a very important role in my life. It was about four years, four years ago when I began to feel very weirdly isolated or something like that. Uh, I don't know why. It was just an odd time in my life. And then Ben had me on his on his podcast, and and it 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 really it's it's you know what it's like when you you encounter somebody who who um, has the same, you know, more or less the same outlook as you, and, it, and it's validating. In a and way. he dresses, you guys cut the exact no, same I mean, look. But when Ben had me on a show, I thought, well, maybe I'm not as crazy as I thought, you know, so thank you. Uh, look, Ben is my benefactor. I, I love him very deeply and dearly, yeah.
I love you guys. I appreciate that, Jeffrey. Jeffrey's been a huge inspiration for me. And uh, we, 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 before we ever met, we had a mutual friend in, uh, in, in chant, in uh, Gregorian chant. And, and she actually worked together to try to connect us to each other because she knew both of us. And she knew Jeffrey's uh, outlook and things, and she knew mine. And, uh, yeah, and, and I said, well, maybe you could get him to sign a book for me. And that, you know, and it went from there to me getting hold of Jeffrey, and then we just connected really well. And Jeffrey became the most, uh, the most common guest on my podcast during the years. Right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. I just have one final quick thing to say. Jeffrey is the first person to ever sit in my chair in this show. I just want to thank you both for, for coming on the show. Um, yes, it's been, it's been a, uh, it honestly has been a, um, Aria, calm down. It has been a, um, a pleasure, and it's, welcome to the Anarchy Roundtable. I know we're not as big as you guys are, but uh, we appreciate the fact that you came. You, you guys actually made an effort to like uh, talk to us about freedom, and um, I don't necessarily agree with all your points, but um, I know. <laughs> 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 we, got, we got pictures. Yeah, yeah we, we got pictures. I have, I have my camera right there. If we bring it around, all right. We we can all get in here. Pictures. <laughs>